All right, welcome to St. Thomas Aquinas Young Adults. My name is Brandon Barker. I am the Director of Evangelization and Discipleship here, and it's my privilege just to be with you all each Thursday, um, just getting to know you all personally, spending time talking about just life and what the Lord is doing in each of our lives. And just this week, I've had several conversations that have just, just reminded me the power of our story. The power of God working through us because that's how God communicates truth and his love through imperfect people like us in one another's lives. We all wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God working through other people. And the same thing for many of us here. It's been young adults or other people that you know that God has used to connect you with him to whether it was your parents or grandparents or friends or mentors, whatever it is that you've had an encounter with the Eucharistic Christ. Um, and that's what we do here at St. Thomas Aquinas Young Adults, kind of the piece that we play um, is helping people find their purpose and passion through fostering authentic community, right, with one another that lives, loves, and shares life in the Eucharistic Christ. Like, that's what we do. So we do all sorts of social stuff and fun stuff, and we have series, and it's a place specifically on Thursdays to connect Young adults with other young adults is a place to just meet other people that have something in common, and that be Jesus Christ, or at least the pursuit of him. And we're doing that imperfectly, but we're doing it together. Uh, and so what you see on a given Thursday night is just a small glimpse of the larger young adult community in the area and at the parish. And that's what we do. We connect with one another. We get involved in one another's lives. And we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ experiencing his love through one another, through his truth, and just through worshiping together, whether it's at Mass or afterwards hanging out and getting something to drink or talking in, in the small groups. Um, but it's also as a place to get connected to the parish. And as I tell you know, people um, when I have the opportunity that Thursday nights is a revolving door. It's a place that there's enough to come in, get connected, but at the same point in time, not so much to just consume and consume and consume indefinitely. At a certain point in time, right, if the Lord is moving you down that path, then you're going to want more. And whether that's deeper friendships, deeper relationships that can't be formed, just getting bits and pieces and small talks. So a lot of what happens here is surface are a little bit below that. Seeds are planted to start conversations, to foster relationships that continue on after this. Um, the same thing with the things we talk about faith. We're not going to exhaust the faith. So a lot of things you're going to hear, it's not for the first time, maybe it, it's a reminder, but again, as the Lord continues to draw us into him, then we're going to be doing stuff in between Thursdays, in between Sundays, because the life as a son or daughter of Jesus is not something that we do, but it's who we are, right? It's something that we are when we, when we wake up, when we go to bed, when we go to work, when we show up here, when we're at mass, whatever we do. And so that's, again, what we're here to do is just kind of play that role and to foster that community because we weren't meant to do life alone all right we're meant to do it with people and so just realize that as you leave here today that God has a plan and a purpose for your life right and it's to be loved by him as a son or a daughter but also not forgetting that next part that it's to be the light of the world to wherever we go from here whoever we encounter we're supposed to bring that love to them with how we talk with how we act with the type of relationships that we have making sure that they're appropriate um, with first and foremost that of what a son or a daughter of God would have and loving and respecting um, that person that's in front of us. And so that's what tonight, as we continue our second uh, talk in the series, last week we talked about um, the purpose of marriage. And tonight we're talking about dating and versus courting. And so why are we doing the series of talks? Again, because so often, right, a lot of people, their view of marriage and how they're going into something so often we set ourselves up for failure because the idea was the same thing that I had going in was much different than the reality of what it was supposed to be, what God's design is for it. And it created some problems for me personally, and I'll share that when me and my wife here uh, in a few weeks talk about um, marriage and it being a gift to the world. So we wanted to, kind of on the front end, because a lot of times people start their, right, their immediate marriage prep when like the rings on the finger, wedding venues are booked, parents are pumped, Things are going on, and like it's basically the deal's kind of done, and then you start going through all this sort of stuff, and you're like, oh, wow, like I wish I'd have known this, or kind of 
kind of prepared a little bit better on the front end. And so, you know, what's John Paul II referred to as proximate, you know, marriage prep, um, which is things like on the front end that typically happens before engagement so that as we are discerning that vocation to married life, that we're walking into it with eyes wide open, realizing that as uh, Jim Lee talked about last week, that it's a gift to the world. It's right there next to vocations, right in the catechism of the seven sacraments, the vocation of the holy orders, the priesthood. Um, that's what marriage is. It's a selfless gift to the world, bringing God's love and his light uh, through that vocation to the married life. And so what this series of eight talks is and kind of how we, how we structured it this time was basically starting kind of in the, at the discernment part, what's the point? And then what Hannah's going to talk about tonight is just that kind of that space of singleness and then encountering that person, how to proceed. And then we're going to get into just what happens once you're engaged. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, just the right of marriage and other things like that. So that's kind of the flow of the talk, kind of from beginning to sort of end, not to exhaust the conversation, but again, to plant some seeds, to get some conversations going so that from here you'll continue to talk and that you will continue to prayerfully discern and seek these things out. God, what are you asking of me? Why are you asking me of this? And what is your design for this? Because when we live outside of God's design, it creates anxiety. It creates pain. It creates just everything but what we are desiring at our core. But when we do things in the way that God designed, it brings about joy and peace. And it truly is a gift to the world. Um, so with that being said, I want to introduce Hannah Jurassic. Hannah is the Associate Director of Youth and Young Adult Ministry at St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Hannah started here, I believe, four years ago um, when we started the Young Adult. I mean, she was like in the original six, seven, eight of us that were started just kind of as, as a small group. I uh, got to know Hannah. She started volunteering with the youth, um, helped us out with a bunch of the communication stuff here at the parish, and then that eventually led to her coming on part-time and then eventually full-time. Uh, she grew up here in Dallas at St. Pat's, went to Bishop Lynch, went to the University of Oklahoma where she studied graphic arts or graphic design, and then ended up working for ASI Gymnastics, um, doing stuff in their marketing department. And yeah, Hannah is engaged to Steve Weigel and they're getting married this summer. So without further ado, one of my most favorite people in the world, Hannah Jurassic. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Um, like Brandon said, I uh, never once really did I ever think I'd be up here talking in front of people about this specifically. Um, I, like he said, I, I am engaged, uh, getting married on June 2nd, so it's coming up pretty fast. Steven's right there in the back, you can wave your hand. So if I ever like talk about him or I'm referring, that's, who I'm, that's the man I'm talking about. So it's public knowledge, out in the open, whatever I'm, whatever I'm saying he knows about. It's not like anything secret. <laughs> Um, but like I said, I, uh, yeah, I never thought I'd be up here talking about this because I was that, that was that typical girl that was just like, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Uh, but like what I have seen and just the, the, the story that God put into my life, um, I'm obviously very thankful for, obviously very thankful for, uh, but it wasn't until I encountered it wasn't until I encountered a man that really showed me what, um, what Christ is uh, and, and how that love manifests itself in human relationships. Because uh, I, was, I was just a very distrusting person, uh, or I, I didn't trust people very well. Um, I was that girl, you know, I had the baggage. I had the boyfriend who I, you know, we ended up breaking up, it, you know, dated right after college, um, dated for like nine months. We broke up. It was a long distance relationship. It wasn't going anywhere. Like, I knew it. I knew it wasn't going anywhere. But, like, as women, we hold on so tight. Like, we, our desire, the core of who we are, like, we're meant to love. And, um, yeah, so, the, I mean, the relationship ended for, like, three years, four years, five years. You know, that baggage is, like, it doesn't go away. And it sucks. And it hurts. Um, and then, but, but what I want to talk about with you guys a little bit is just kind of bringing in a little bit of my story. Um, seeing what God has done in my life, and hopefully, you know, something will resonate. I'm not an expert. Like, please don't don't judge me for what I'm about to say. Like, I'm not an expert. I don't have any degree in, in dating or courting. Like, this is just a this is just a conversation, and I just want to open up a little bit about 
Um, obviously, truth, uh, open up about, you know, just God's word and what he says, um, and open up about the teachings of the church, um, and hopefully, you know, we can just kind of carry on some conversation from that. Uh, so, like Brandon talked about, Jim Lee spoke last week uh, just about the purpose of marriage, so I'm just going to talk about just his three points that he mentioned, and I thought it was important for you guys that are new here tonight that weren't here last week just to kind of reiterate what he said. Um, so, first off, looking at the difference between... Uh, you know, what the world says uh, marriage is versus what it actually is. So, you know, number one being marriage is a cure for loneliness versus a call to holiness. Um, in the catechism, it says, by the grace of matrimony, couples help one another to attain holiness in their married life and in welcoming and educating their children. Uh, number two is marriage as uh, an achievement for promotion versus a vocation to love and serve your spouse, God, the church, and the world. Uh, marriage is something that is a God-given gift. It is a gift to us. Um, it's not something we, we uh, plan necessarily, uh, something that we work towards, but uh, it's not necessarily something we plan. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. But you know, we obviously all have a call uh, in the world to, um, to be holy, to love. Um, our general call uh, to love, and then our, the second part is that particular call to love another person. Um, and kind of what manifests itself from that. Um, and then number three, self-fulfillment versus a self-gift. Uh, truly, God alone is the source of our happiness. Um, he's the only one that can fill us up and sustain that love uh, in a relationship. Um, so this is the goal. This is what, you know, the church has taught us. This is the vocation of marriage. Um, but how do we get there? So a uh, little bit of backstory. Um, like I said, I, you know, I was in this relationship. I was kind of going through those years of holding on to something, longing for something, longing for love, longing for that thing that was going to fill me up. Um, something I shared with the young adult right before tonight was this guy, great guy, he's Catholic. You know, like, clearly any Catholic guy is great, right? <laughs> uh, sorry, no offense to Catholic men out there. But, you know, you, you, you find, you have that, like, you have those morals and you have those things that you're longing for. And to me, Catholicism was a huge one. And so, you know, there was a man, he, you know, he was there for me and we had great conversation and thought, you know, maybe this is a guy that God's calling me toward. Clearly not. But, um, but, you know, I had kind of my standards in place. Um, but after that ended, uh, I was, you know, you just, you just everything is lost everything is gone you know especially when the family's involved like that's really really hard to let go of um yeah it was just really really hard for me but um it was a certain promise that he had made to me that he was coming to dallas and i just remember like he never did uh until that one day i get this stupid snapchat and we were still like you know connected on social media at this point and he gets snapchat that he's moving to dallas and i was all right, God, three years, and I am feeling this way? Like, what the heck? Like, that was my, that was my turning moment when I realized, like, you got to let go. Oh, my gosh. And I, I don't know what it was in me, but it was just the grace of God that in that moment, I was just like, all right, it's finished. You know? He made a promise. He fulfilled the promise, technically, <laughs> but not in the way that I expected. Um, so, I mean, it, it, and I'm, again, speaking as, as a woman's side, you know, men, I, you can probably just relate to that as well sometimes. That, but when these relationships are so invested, the family life is invested, and, and you're just thinking, like, this is it, this is it, this is it. Um, and then God kind of wipes away that, that desire that you think is there. Um, but, like, little did, he, did I know, you know, what was, uh, what was to come. And one thing that, um, that a friend told me years ago after this had happened she goes, Hannah, God doesn't give you gold, or God doesn't present you gold and then give you silver. It's like, huh, okay. But as I look at it and you like realize, all right, like he's not going to give you something and then just take it all away and like just put your standards a little bit lower than what you, what you expected. Like he's always going to give you something a little bit more. Um, and I just love that quote and I wanted to share that. I didn't expect to share that with you guys, but I just wanted to share that. So how do we get here? If this is the goal, if marriage is the goal, most, I mean, okay, can I just ask this? Is anybody engaged in this room? Oh, yeah, you guys are. Yeah, you are. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, 
seriously dating? Can I ask that? I just kind of want to know what I'm, what I'm speaking to. If anybody cares. You don't have to raise your hand. Uh, most people single? Yeah. Okay. Wow. No, nobody wants to hear that. Be, be confident who you are. Goodness. All right. Anyways. So how do we get there? How do we get there? We got to run. We got to run towards God. That time in your life right now, wherever, whatever phase that you're in, if you are, you know, presume a lot of you guys are single. But if you are in that time of your life, this is the most sacred time that you will have. The most, most sacred time that you will have right now. It is a blessing. It is a blessing. It is a blessing. And I can't say that enough. It is, it is the most formative it is the time in your life where you, it, it is you and God. It is you and God only. I mean, you got family, you got friends, you got people surrounding you. Obviously, you got community. Like, that's, that's a given. Like, you need that in your life. But, like, at the end of the day, it is you and God. And who you are before God is who you are. And you have that time and that space to run and run and run towards him. Uh, Psalm 37 says, find your delight in the Lord who will give you your heart's desire. If we can't pursue God, if we can't run to him, if we can't even crawl, if we can't even crawl to him, how do we know our heart's desire? We're all longing for love. We're all longing for truth. And we're all longing for that person. But that person every day of our lives will be Jesus Christ. I know Stephen and I have talked about this. And there's moments, um, you know, when we were, when we were courting, uh-huh, um, talk about why I laughed, uh, courting and then engaged. And there's moments when the realization happens. It's like, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen to him. He literally could die tonight in a car wreck. I have no idea. That is not my plan. That is God's plan, but it's real and it's honest. And you have to be open. You have to be truthful. And re- reality is set in place. Like, I don't know. I don't know. But if I'm not grounded in my relationship with God today and something happens, I'm still left with God. I'm still left with Jesus Christ. Like, he, is, he will continue to fulfill me because I know the plan that he has for me. Um, I want to share this with you. This is one of the quotes, and I'm going to read the whole thing because this was, a, this was a moment in my life that changed me. It was a book from uh, Sarah Swafford called Emotional Virtue. And it says, I want you to run, run to Jesus, and I want you to take everything you are feeling, everything you are worried about, your past, your pain, and I want you to lay it all down at his feet. Put everything in a box and drop it off at his feet. You don't have to carry it anymore. Fall into his arms and let him love you and forgive you. And when you are strong and whole and you have been healing, I want you to run with him. And when the time is right, glance to the side and see who is running with you. This changed my life. It really did. This book is a really great book. It's called Emotional Virtue, The Guide to Drama-Free Relationships. Um, but it was a great resource for me because I didn't, I wasn't pursuing God in the way that he has called each and every one of us to pursue him. Um, and I, I didn't necessarily, I knew that I was always called to marriage, but I, you you try to plan it and it can't be planned. There's no, there's no plan that you can put in front of you and just say, this is the way it's going to go. Because I guarantee you it's not the way it's going to go. I mean, engaged couple, you can understand, like, it doesn't happen the way that you expect it to ever happen. Um, but it's beautiful, and it's wholesome, and it's so much better than you could ever, uh, ever imagine. Jim also um, just talked about discernment and what that looks like. And I'm here to say today that the pursuit of marriage starts now. It's already begun. Like, and it, and it begins before the marriage ever, or the engagement, or the, even the dating, or the courtship, whatever. Like, it, it starts now. Um, because we have to, end, when that time comes and when that person comes into your life, you're asked to give so much more than you ever thought you would be able to give. And I'm not even, I don't even have kids yet. Like, Brandon talks about the worst stories sometimes, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I can't even imagine that. Like, I'm struggling now and planning a wedding and life and moving and, like, doing all these things, and I'm like, I can't even imagine putting a kid in the mix of it. Like, it's going to only get more complicated, um, but God can sustain, and he will always continue to, to, to fill it up if we continue to run to him. Um, so the pursuit of marriage begins way before courting. Um, obviously, being focused on Jesus Christ is the source of all life. Um, 
Only he can fill us up. He can sustain happiness and trust in his promise. And listen to the direct call of your vocation. Uh, discernment was always a word in my life that I hated. I honestly did. I hated the word discern discernment because I didn't know what it meant. I didn't. Um, up until probably just a couple years ago, I was, uh, you know, in this pursuit of my, of my, I guess, these past couple years in my life, um, like Brandon said, I was kind of working in ministry, trying to figure out, you know, where my place was in all of this. Um, so I knew that if I was to give and I was continuing to love and I was continuing to give even more, like, I needed to work on myself first. And that's what God showed me um, just through a lot of just poor mistakes that I made with, you know, whatever relationships in the past, you know, that we all, that we all have. But, um, you know, there was a moment in my life I was so in love with ministry and I, I still hadn't necessarily discerned that vocation, but I was like, well, maybe I am called to be a religious. I don't know. I never really learned about it before. I never really knew what discernment meant, but I knew that I loved people and that was my kind of primary aim in life. And I wanted to really, really take root in that, but I didn't know where it was leading me. Um, so I actually only discerned, you know, really discerned and just prayerfully discerned uh, marriage just a couple years ago uh, myself. Even though, like, as a kid, like, I always knew I was going to get married. Like, you always have that desire of your heart. Like, the desire of your heart is so important um, to listen to that. Uh, but I just, I, I needed to hear it from God, and I only knew it because of myself. I didn't really listen to him. Um, so I was at that point in my life where I was like, I love Jesus so much. No man it was ever going to be good enough for me. Like, that was my life. It's like, no man is ever going to be good enough. Only Jesus, like, Jesus, if you have just given us yourself in the Eucharist, like, you have given us the fullness of the truth, and, like, I can't even imagine somebody that's going to love me more than this. Like, I, I just couldn't. I couldn't imagine it. Like, that was the point that I had gotten to. And this, again, this is just my story. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, he had, he had different plans for me. Um, so this is, this is the slide that Jim had talked about, the sermon, and what that kind of looks like. Um, obviously, number one, prayer. Frequenting the sacraments. Striving for holiness, the pursuit of God and God alone. At any time, every 24-7, all the time, every day of your life, pursuing him and loving him. Spiritual guidance, you know, direction, whether that's, uh, you know, whether that is a priest or a religious um, or just a trusted friend or a parent, somebody that you can go to and just have these open conversations with, um, somebody that you can truly, truly trust. Uh, and if it is a vocational discernment, you know, if it is the discernment of marriage, finding a whole, like a wholesome Catholic married couple, uh, we've got plenty of them in the church. We've got people that are around that are willing to share and willing just to, um, yeah, just to share what it means to be married in the church, what it means to be married in the Catholic Church specifically, and how, do, how does my vocation play into my role in my community and in my parish. Um, and then in consecration to Jesus through Mary, this is something that if you haven't heard about, we have books. Um, Maggie is like just pumping her fist back there. She's so pumped about this. Yeah, uh, the consecration to Jesus through Mary. Uh, there's a devotional book that we have in the back, just 33 Days to Morning Glory. Um, and just looking at, at Mary, I mean, she is our, she is our mother. Um, and her yes to God and to whatever plan that she had, or that he had for her, is just the ultimate, the ultimate goal for each and every one of us. Um, and so just devoting our lives and devoting our prayer to her, um, or to Jesus, you know, through her, and just letting her intercede for you. When Stephen and I, I had actually done this the year before I had met Stephen myself, and I had done my consecration to Jesus, um, consecration to, um, um, to Jesus through Mary. And then Stephen and I did this when we started dating last, well, right after we, a couple months after we started dating, um, we just let her, let her enter into our, into our space and our life um, and pray to her. And we continue to pray to her, you know, every day uh, just for her intercession in our relationship. So, highly recommend as well. All right. So, in saying all this, we are going to go back to the point of why this conversation, um, why I felt the important need to talk about dating or courting, but I also didn't really feel like I could jump into it without saying what I just said. Um, you know, I could spin and I could talk to you guys, you know, about singleness and that time for a lot longer, but I just felt like, you know, I needed that little bit of space in there. Um, just to kind of share a little bit about why it is important and what that pursuit should be, because the pursuit every day should be towards God. But when that time and that space comes, 
and there's a man or a woman that you are, you know, presented with in life. You know, whether it's now, whether it's, you know, tomorrow, who knows. Uh, but you got, to, you know, you got a couple options. So in the midst of what I'm going to be talking about for um, this next portion of time, what I want to mention is that in my definition of dating, that what I'm going to be talking about again tonight is, basically the definition of like the secular world's definition of dating. It's the test driving um, without any intention of marriage as the end goal, dating to have the status just because of a, you know, a physical relationship or just, um, you know, an intimacy, whatever that may be. That, that's, that's just tonight for my, de- that's my definition of courting, or my definition of dating. And then courting is the intentional pursuit of marriage with a man or woman, keeping Christ at the center and setting boundaries in place to maintain chastity. Courting is not, what, what I'm talking about tonight, courting is not having, you know, Stephen's family, my family, go to a, you know, pumpkin patch together <laughs> while, you know, going home to play board games and then being in bed by eight. Like, that's not what I'm talking about here. And this is why I really felt called to talk about this because I hated the word courting. I hated it because I just feel like it's gotten so warped over time. Um, and I didn't necessarily have... I guess a couple of years ago, I just didn't have those just people in my life that I could look to and realize, okay, what does it actually mean to date or court or whatever you want to call it? Like, what does it actually mean? Because I didn't, I didn't really perceive that. But then I was talking to Brandon about putting this, this series together. I was like, well, shoot, Steve and I did that. You know, like we did courting. And I just didn't even realize it because I was just like the word itself I didn't like. Apparently, I don't like words. I don't like the sermon. I like courting. Um, and I think it just let out a lot of just like frustration uh, and the ill-formed, you know, just kind of life that I had had in past um, in just my relationships. So this is what we're going to be talking about. So there's dating, there's courting, <laughs> and I felt, really felt called to talk about this really briefly. We're not going to get into a lot of it, um, but I did feel called because this is where this is where we're at. These are conversations that I'm having. Um, I'm even having them with. Uh, high schoolers, not that they're actually doing this, but they, like, that's their mentality of dating still tender. You know, like, it's, it's, it's in the world, and it's just so, it's so heart- disheartening. But what I want to preface here is that online dating in itself is not a, is not a bad thing, but I do want to talk about it. And um, this could be related to you. This could be related to a friend of yours. Um, I'm not here to judge. But what I, do, what I do think is important to talk about is if we have gone through this discernment and we're pursuing God and pursuing God alone, um, just asking yourself why. Like, why in this moment, um, like, what role is this playing in my life? If you have just prayerfully discerned, and it is a moment in your life, and you are just like, you know, God, I just feel like there's a person out there for me. I love you so much. Like, let's just, let's just go. Let's just do this. Then that, I mean, that's fine. Let, let the Lord work in that. But what role is it playing? Uh, because if you haven't asked yourself the question, are you letting the energy and the time spent in search of the person get in the way of the person of Jesus Christ? So that's just the question I'm leaving out, out there. We're not going to get into a whole lot of this, uh, but I did feel like it was important. I think a lot of the times, I can speak for myself too, a lot of the times we're just looking for the person. We're just trying to let the plan unfold in the way that I want to unfold it and not letting God do his job. Um, this is just the culture that I've seen, especially with Tinder. Not necessarily. There's some really good apps out there, so I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say that there's not. Um, that's for you. That's for you and God to decide. That's not my role. Uh, but I just want to ask yourself the question: Why? You know, what role is it playing in your life today? You know, if that's or that your friend, whoever it may be, um, and then is it getting in the way of the person of Jesus Christ and the time that's spent there? So, if the CERN right courting is easy. It's not always easy, but it's most of the time easy. So according, what does that mean? The intentional pursuit of a man or a woman with marriage as the focus, marriage as the end goal. Stephen, when Stephen and I started dating, that first date, I was so chill. I was at the most peace I'd ever felt in my entire life. Uh, and I knew, I mean, I seriously knew in that moment, um, God had a plan, and I think it was marriage. Like, I really did in that first date. 
Um, it was the easiest time that I'd ever felt. It was just, it was relaxed, it was chill, it was fun. Um, and at the end of the day, he asked me what my intention was because he had said, my intention is to pursue you and I want to pursue you only. And I want to pursue us in the presence of God towards marriage. Men, it works. Like, like I'm telling you, if you have, if you, hmm, I'm not going to put this all on the men, I'm sorry. But, but it, it, is, it is our role as united front, as brothers and sisters in Christ, um, to allow that intention to unfold. And it's okay to unfold in day one. If that is not your intention from day one on a date, um, just ask yourself why. Why is it? But what is it, what's it in this person? There's obviously something in the person, but ask yourself why that is not the end goal. Um, yeah. It does bring about peace. The inner, the inner peace flows from God's will being done. You continue to rely on him and continue to rely on uh, just his word and his truth um, that he will sustain and he will fulfill the time and the space that he will give you. Um, he will continue to unfold that peace. Um, and that will that will continue to manifest itself in the in the courtship. Trust in His plan and not and not your own. Um, I'm gonna go back to this real fast. Oh, oh, oh. If hmm, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Anyways. Trusting in his plan and not your own, when, what does that look like? Like I said, we can all plan. We can all plan our lives, we can plan our jobs, and we can plan you know, what's for dinner tonight and all this. Um, but the most important thing that I can tell you with this inner peace and how that flows out, um, courting isn't, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't easy all the time, and I shouldn't say that. But, or I should say that, because there was a lot of things that Stephen and I, in just our relationship, we had to talk about. Um, there was a lot of baggage that was still brought into the relationship, but it was open and honest from day one. And I had to, and we continued to pursue uh, what God's plan was in that time and that space. Um, and letting, letting him do his job and not us controlling it. Because the moment that we controlled it, the moment we got out of, we got out of whack a little bit here and there. Um, but I think, too, uh, you know, I, I, I had that distrust just in men in general. And that was still kind of something that I had to carry and I had to really work on in the beginning stage of our relationship. It wasn't until like four months in to like could just really let that go. And I had to prayerfully, prayerfully just let God enter into that space and realize, all right, if this is the man you're calling me to, like I, I, need, I need this gone. Like please take it from me. And um, so, yeah, I mean, he, uh, he can work in, in mysterious ways. Uh, something else that I do want to mention uh, is just the physical intimacy in courting. We all got the question, right? Like, we all got to talk about it. And uh, Andrew Gill, he will be talking, we'll be having a whole series, or a whole talk, I'm sorry, on sex uh, in a couple weeks. And he, um, he is a little bit more of an expert than, than I am, uh, just as a, as a counselor and a therapist. And so uh, he, will, he will go into a lot of more depth. But I do just want to talk about the importance um, of boundaries and setting those boundaries in place from day one. Um, this is an institution of the church. You know, this isn't something that is coming from me. This is what, um, what has been told and has been said to us. And we know this. You know, like most of us really, really do know this. Um, but it's not. It's a. Uh, it's not easy. Um, but at that time when sex, I mean, sex in itself, does, it clouds. It clouds the judgment. It clouds what the whole person is about when it comes to you know comes to that courtship. Um, our hearts have to be whole and have to be full in that time just to let the truth of ourselves be known. Um, and it can cloud, it clouds the mind um, just from really pursuing God in that space, in that time. And letting the, the physicalness of a marriage um, should be you know, obviously kept in that space. The physicalness of dating should um, be kept to looking at the person as a brother and sister in Christ and respecting that time and that space and not allowing what should be, what should be beautiful and holy in a marriage to flow into a courtship um, and just keeping that in mind as, um, as the fullness of courtship you know, continues to unfold. Something else I want to point on, and Jim Lee uh, touched on this last week, but also is just cohabitation. Um, 
you know, marriage preceded by cohabitation is 46% more likely to end in divorce. Um, that's something that I found off the USCCB um, website itself. So those are just statistics that you can find um, anywhere too. So just throwing that out there. And like I said, uh, this person, this courtship, uh, it is your brother and sister in Christ. Um, you know, and what is suitable in marriage and what the pursuit of marriage should be in that space and that time should be left to, to that marriage um, and not letting it get in the way of seeing the whole person for who they are in their heart um, because that is just the most important thing that we can give to them and that is and likewise it should be the only thing that they should be you know giving to us as well so uh, is there a courting timeline I don't know it's up to you and God but uh, it is up to the individual re relationship, and that is God's call. Uh, each relationship is different. Um, each relationship has its own timeline. If God is working it and you're praying every single day that God is the person that you're calling me to, like, he'll unfold that. I could say Stephen was probably ready to marry me, like, after two months, and I was like, whoa, buddy, calm down. <laughs> but, like, it get, it, we had to let that time unfold itself until I was at that space, and he was like, kind of pulled back, you know, and things were more evened out. You know, God had to let the time work because we prayed every day and we allowed him to enter in. And when I was like finally at that point, I was like, all right, buddy, come on, let's go. You know, like it, I think God just needed to pull me into a space where it was, you know, it was equal, it was matched. And he revealed, and I kept telling him, I was like, all right, whatever time it happens, I don't care. I just know that God's going to let us know that. Because I was, I was a little bit like, Ugh, okay is real you know like it, it gets it gets it's not scary in the sense of like it's a difficult it's a difficult you know solution like it's not that it was difficult i guess for us to i don't know what i'm trying to say i'm just gonna stop talking about that yeah. if you are dating years and years um if if um you know, if chastity is remained in the relationship um, and there is still not that intentional pursuit of marriage, I think there is something that has to be addressed. Um, when chastity is set in place, that discernment, if you are allowing God to enter into that, if he is the third person in that relationship, it should not be too complicated. It will not be complicated. Um, it will be an easy choice. It will be easy one way or another. Um, but he will only answer that for you. He will be the only one to answer that question for you. Um, there's exceptions. I'm not going to say that every person that dates for, you know, years and years and has remained chaste is, you know, not in the pursuit to marriage. That's not mine to say. Um, but if that is set in place and there is something that he is still not, God has still not revealed to you, I just ask yourself to, you know, why? What is that? Um, and to allow you and the other person just to, um, yeah, talk about it and to see where God is calling you. And like I said, marriage to the other question should never be scary. It's not going to be necessarily easy to just say, all right, this is it, let's do it, but um, it should never be scary. It's not. It's really not. And like I said, um, prayer, prayer, and prayer. It is the most pinnacle part of any relationship and any courtship. God should be there from day one, from date one, and he should manifest himself so much in this relationship that it hurts to pray more. Like it literally hurts to even continue to pray because you have prayed so much. And just letting him be, letting him be, and letting him do his part in this, in this relationship. Because it's not up to us. It really isn't up to us. Um, letting him do his job, letting him do what he has called each and every one of us to do. Um, and if that is marriage, and if that is the pursuit of marriage, um, he's going to unfold that in the most beautiful, in the most beautiful way. This is something Anne Lucchetti said this last year in our relationship series. Um, but this is something Steve and I, and we still every once in a while will pray this prayer, and we'll pray it together and be like, Lord, if this is not your will, literally hit me with a two by four, knock me on my face. Even if it means I have like a bloody nose, whatever it may be, hit me in the face and just let me know. Like, because I think a lot of the times when he is not in the center, when he is not, um, when you are not entering him into the relationship, 
we, we get so blinded just by our own personal, um, just that feeling, you know, those feelings that overwhelm us. And they're there. Like, those feelings aren't going to go anywhere. But if God isn't manifesting himself in the very center of this relationship, um, and you're not asking him if this is his will, um, he's going it, to, it's going to hurt. You know, it could potentially hurt. It may not. It may, it may go, it may end beautifully. Um, but there's always a new day and there's always a new time that he can continue to enter into any relationship. And this isn't something that's new. This isn't like brand new information. Um, every relationship in our lives, our you know, families, our friends, you know, God should always be the center. Um, but if we're not doing that now, we're not allowing him to enter into that space and that time now in every relationship, um, it's going to be, you know, that much harder um, in the future. And then prayer equals stability. Um, this is something, too, that, and just my personal experience, um, Stephen was just always very good at saying, you know, I am not going to promise you that I'm going to be perfect and I'm going to, you know, like you or you're not going to like me every day, but I'm going to offer you stability. Um, I'm going to offer you that I can be there, that I will continue to be there. I will continue to love you, even if it hurts sometimes, but I will offer you that stability. And that, um, that was just the proof to me that, that God's love is so great that he, you know, he sent his son down to the earth to be with us. And in that space, in that time, um, he loved us so much to die for us. And if this person that we are called to be with for the rest of our life isn't willing to die with us, you know, then what is our role? Like, what, do we, what role do we have in this relationship? Because it's, it's a self-sacrificial love. And, you know, we talked about it last week. You die to self every single day in a relationship because you have to pour out yourself so much. Um, and if we are emptying ourselves of just, you know, you know, sex or porn or whatever it may be, and we're continuing to empty ourselves in those space in that time, um, you know, like what role is a relationship going to do? Well, it may, it's probably just going to make it worse. Um, but allowing him to enter into that space and letting him fill up, um, and when the person comes along or when that relationship is whole and right, um, you know, revealing the love of Jesus Christ through a person and allowing yourself to love another person with the full heart that he has given each and every one of us. Um, like I said, we're all gonna we're gonna talk about some things in the next couple of weeks. We're gonna talk about family of origin and how that relates into a relationship and a courtship. Because um, let me talk talk about the opposite. Like Stephen, we are so opposite in our families in a lot of ways, and it's it's been a lot you know challenging um, just to just to mix households and mix things of you know how his family did this and how my family did this. Um, so then those are conversations that are important to talk about. They're important to know now. Uh, I think uh, we were we were obviously were dating last year when this relationship series took place. So it was kind of a it was just a good good test, I guess you could say, and um, realizing those important conversations that we needed to have um, that we didn't necessarily know yet. Um, just have fun. I mean, this is this is something that I just I felt like the talk was a little bit too heavy, and I was like, at the end of the day, like it should be fun. Like God will will reveal it, and He will manifest Himself in a relationship. Um, and hopefully it will lead to marriage. Um, but any courtship should be fun. Um, you should allow the family to enter into that space from an early stage. Um, you know, if family is a, is a challenge for you, or, you know, maybe they're far away, maybe the relationship isn't whole, maybe, maybe, your par- maybe you're in a situation where your family isn't necessarily um, supportive of your faith. Maybe they're not necessarily supportive of, um, I don't know, maybe your state in life or just where, you, where you're at. Maybe you're a convert and that's just a really rough uh, you know, part of your life. I don't know. I don't know your story, but allowing your family to enter into that. Because when family and kids do come along, um, it's just going to be that much harder. Allowing them to, to have a little bit of input, you know. They kind of know you the best. Having some space for them to really see the truth of the relationship um, and seeing. Because obviously family can, can see things that we sometimes have blinders too. Um, yeah. I think that's all I got. So we will head into uh, just some small group time. This time isn't really meant to, to share. And if this is your first time here, um, the conversation, you don't got to divulge everything. You don't have to like share your deepest, darkest secrets. Um, but just allowing yourself to, to be open and honest. Uh, and just seeing what, you know, what happens in the conversation. Um, so, yeah, we'll have about, about 20 minutes or so, uh, 
So just gather in like groups of six or seven, whoever is in your circle. Um, so yeah, that's all I got. All right, hey, let's go ahead and circle it back up. If y'all would, y'all give it up for Hannah. I know sometimes it is tough to talk about certain subjects. I know that that was something that she had communicated um, because, again, as far as being experts, no. But at the same point in time, what we do have is a story to share, right? And sometimes those stories resonate well and match up. Other times it can even potentially be discouraging because you're going like either, well, I want that or, oh, that didn't work out for me or whatever the case is. But let the Lord working through somebody else and what he's done in their life and be transformative. It's meant to be like encouraging and just to see one other example um, or another example of what God working through his children has the possibility of doing, of transforming and doing that. Because again, every one of us has a story um, that God is playing a role, whether we acknowledge it, whether we see it or not. And so just understanding that our stories are going to be different, but at the same point in time, there are certain things that God has laid out and, and has a plan for, and then we need to do things according to his plan. There's going to be nuances and certain things that may be different. And can God redeem even sin, yes, that's why Jesus died. So God can even work amidst your sense of your sin. They're going like, oh my gosh, like I am either currently in a relationship and we are, we are dating in the secular sense. I am in this for me. We're sexually active. We're just like, we're doing it all sorts of wrong. Well, do you know what? Like God loves you exactly where you're at, right? He just loves you too much to leave you there. And maybe that's why we're here, right? Because God is always calling us to that next step. And what is that next step? What does it look like to live a life and to pursue him um, according to that? So just a couple things to uh, wrap up. One, for the record, having kids is awesome. <laughs> it is. I don't say that like joking. Hannah, we work together, so she hears certain things. And I know from her perspective, same way before I did, it just like, I don't know how I had space for anything else because life was crazy enough. And then the thought of introducing other things. So it's just God gives you enough grace to handle and to love and to do whatever it is he entrusts you with, whether that's another person or children. And so how he does it, he's God. He just, I can't explain it. I just know that we're on kid five and I didn't want to have any because I was so selfish. Um, and then it just one after the other and at this point it's like man I have the opportunity if God will entrust them to me to like invest in them and let them encounter the Lord and to raise up right these disciples and apostles to go be the light of the world so like what's the greatest thing I can do first and foremost be holy um, have a holy marriage and be that light to the world and encourage people because marriages and families and the way people talk about kids and you know, oh, like this, or, oh, man, marriage and people are bad-mouthing. I mean, like, that's so often the view that we get, almost that marriage is this or it. No, I mean, like, it is meant to be a gift of the world. And so what does, what does this world need more than anything? Holy people, holy marriages, people that are loving their kids and realize their vocation and their call. That's what attracts people to Jesus Christ is when they see imperfect examples of his love manifesting itself through us. So what does the world need from us that are called to the married life? Like, God needs us to realize that I, our identity as sons and daughters and our purpose and what that vocation is and to live it out with his grace the best we can. And what it does is it attracts people. People want to know, why is your marriage different than the other marriages I see? Well, like, let me tell you. Like, do you know Jesus? Um, because that's ultimately, like, why any of that's possible. Right? We can't love selflessly unless we've opened ourselves up to the selfless love that God gave us by dying on the cross. How can we love kids? Kids can be the biggest pain in the butt. They can be an annoyance. They can hinder everything that I want to do. They can drive me crazy and want to keep me away from the house when I'm not living my identity as a son of God, when I lose sight of my purpose and why I'm here, when I'm in that and tapping into his love and his grace 
I mean, it's the, I mean, like I want 10, not because I think I can handle 10, but because I just, I mean, it's, it's a completely different perspective. So that's what I do as I'm going through our gate. I'm asking Mary to help me, um, to give me the strength um, through her intercessions and the Lord working through me so that when I walk in the door, they're not getting dad that's gassed and ticked and just selfish, but they're encountering the love of Jesus through me. And I have the opportunity to be the means of him or the means of not. And so again, like what does the world need? It needs saints. It needs holy people that are living out their vocation to the fullness. And can we do that? No, not alone, but by his grace. Um, I mean, anything's possible. So I just wanted to say that. And also when my daughter is growing up, I am definitely taking her to the pumpkin patch if there is a dude that wants to wants to do that. So that's going to be my definition according to her. So if y'all want to join me, let me know. Um, just wanted to put out that out there. A couple things just to kind of, you know, like not only uh, like clarify, but just to kind of round out. I was talking to Hannah back a second ago. As far as a question, I guess I, I would say probably one of the more often questions with regarding dating is about what about dating like a non-Catholic? What about dating a non-believer? What about dating, you know, this? When I was a non-Catholic, like I wouldn't date someone that was like in a different ballpark, not because I was better or cooler, whatever the case is, but, you know, the Bible talks about being equally yoked. And that, that, that uh, quote that um, Hannah put up earlier from, from that book that was talking about run to God, run, 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 and see who is running there and who's beside you. That's the thing, right? Um, when we're running towards the Lord and we're yoked with someone that's doing the same, well then, like we're pulling in the same direction and we're actually helping one another move towards Him. When we're not, well then someone's actually pulling us away from Him as opposed to pushing us forward. So it's one of those, again, me and my wife are always on different pages. We're on different parts of the journey, just like everybody. So are you going to be with somebody that y'all are every step of the way, 110% on the same page? Quite likely not. But in prayerfully discerning through that, right, God uses us in one another's life to help us continue to move forward. That way when the one person falls down, the other one's there to pick up and vice versa. But so often, sometimes it's the one that's pulling and pulling and pulling. And ultimately, in time, they're actually being pulled back. And that's not the point of marriage, right? That's not the point of doing that. So in that discerning process, Man, I, I can't like challenge you enough, and it's uncomfortable sometimes, um, but praying with that person that you are courting, that there's intentionality behind it, and that you're starting it off on the right foot. If you're already in that process and you're not doing that start today, like if that is awkward, then, I mean, it's just going to be multiplied in marriage because there's going to be plenty of other things that are awkward. And if we're not willing to do something that's awkward for the sake of something that's so much greater, um, I, I think it was Matthew Kelly, and, and I haven't checked the data and the pew, the poll, but he said something to the fact of people that, like marriages that pray together at least once a week, I mean, it's like some crazy, like 240 times less likely to get divorced than those that don't. So, um, like I said, most statistics are made up. Moral of the story is, um, <laughs> like, but that was the one that I got from him. Um, but anyway, I mean, like, it's something, it sets the foundation. And when you're praying with somebody and for somebody, well, then it sets the tone that you acknowledge and you understand who's a part of that relationship and how you view the other person. Um, and, yeah, I mean, like, that's just something that communicates to the other person that, hey, like, like, this is important to me. And guys, too, man, like, a lot of times, it just, I mean, like, take the lead. Um, it's, it's one of those, it's a pretty powerful thing uh, when a guy says, hey, like, like, let's pray. Yes, of course, before meals, but just whether it's at the beginning of the date, hey, Lord, we just want to ask that you bless this time. Ask that you would help us to um, just continue to discern your will for our lives and why you've placed us in this place. Ask that, ask that you protect us um, just with with all things, with our conversations, with our actions and all that sort of stuff, and we give this time to you. Man, I mean, like, that would blow, ladies, would that blow most of y'all's mind if that was how the party started? Yeah, I mean, like, that's just, that's the tip. That's why y'all came. Um, all right, but 
at the same time, like ladies too, I mean, it's the same thing. Like sometimes like we're nervous and we don't want to do this just because for whatever reason that just, it is. And so, I mean, like feel free, you know, to start the party and to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, like, like those are just a couple of things that I think are, are really important again, because it sets the tone because I was talking to a young adult uh, recently that was just talking about, because we never know why God puts people in our lives. There've been girls that got put in, in, in my life to do several things. I mean, not necessarily, you know, that they were going to be my wife because that was only one, but God used them in my life for different things. But what we can do is acknowledge, right, that brother and sister in Christ, and we can always bring Christ to them by our actions, how we treat them and what we do, not knowing is that our spouse or is it not? Because it's going to take time for him to unfold that. But someone I was talking to recently just shared that a person that God had put in their life that they had, that they had um, courted for a while ended up you know, it was discerned that that wasn't who that they were marrying. But God used that person in their life to help them reconnect with their Catholic faith and their love for Jesus in the Eucharist. And God used that person in their life to do so. But it could have gone the other way. Like plenty of times that story goes the other way and God actually hurt or that the person hurt and challenged and actually was the means that pushed them away because of how it was. So that's something that we can do until we've signed the deal and we've made that covenant like, they are our brother and sister in Christ, and it's important that we treat them, that the relationship and what we do is as such, because that's how we're loving God, is through that person. So, I know when Hannah talking about physical intimacy and all that sort of stuff, I'm talking about Andrew Gill, um, is going to be talking about it more, more in detail here in a bit. Um, while we're not experts on that and don't have degrees in theology of the body and all that sort of stuff, what I do know is, like, God. And I know that he created it. And he created certain things within a certain context, and there are certain things that are suitable and certain things that aren't. Um, and so at the end of the day, right, we heard a lot about prayer and prayer and prayer. And it's like, dude, I want to hear, like, how long? Is it six months? Is it a year? Like, how far is too far? I mean, that's like the question, like, how far is too far, you know, in physical intimacy? And I think the thing is, again, like, the question when you care about the person that's there, it's not like, okay, like, there's a cliff over there, like, how far can I get her to the edge before she falls off? You know what I'm saying? Like, who would ask that? No. I mean, if you're really thinking about somebody, I mean, you want to make sure that, that, that you're protecting them, not just, man, how far am I going to walk them out there? So it's one of those, like, why would we even, like, try to put them in spiritual danger by falling into the state of mortal sin if we really care about that person? Yes, are there attractions that should be there? Yeah, that's, if there's not, that's probably a bad sign. You know what I'm saying? Like, probably don't need to pray a whole lot more about that like that is a good thing like like that's part of the deal um and that's the reason why there's boundaries that are there because again as a brother and sister in christ there's certain boundaries and certain things that are suitable and so i mean like what i say is it's like when you first meet somebody there's a certain level of conversation there's certain things you do that's appropriate for that relationship right you don't necessarily somebody you just met give them a big hug and a kiss on the cheek and like hey man it's nice to meet you like at least in our society and how we do it here that's not right that's not suitable they're same things i have two sisters and i mean i'm i'm a very affectionate person i mean like i kiss my sisters on the cheeks and we hug and you know yeah some of y'all think that's weird but whatever that's what I do. So when I was dating my wife, right, she's my, si she's my sister in Christ, and so there's certain things that are appropriate and certain things that are preparing for the marital act. And so, again, with the, the analogy of the cliff, the question we shouldn't be asking is, how far is too far? That's, that, that's just the wrong mindset, right? It's how can I love this person no matter what, whether they're my wife, whether they're just a sister in Christ, a brother in Christ, whatever it is. And that, 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 it's, it's the wrong question to ask. Um, what, what question was I asking growing up? How far is too far? Like, that's what I wanted to know. I mean, why? Because I wasn't pursuing the relationship. I mean, I, I, was, I was very poorly formed in that area. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to, to share, that, share that with you all, right? Ask the right questions. Um, ask for the grace of God. And when we make a mistake, right, does God remove his love? No, like reconcile. That's what God does. He makes great things out of a mess. It's not a license to, to, to do it, but realizing no matter what we've done, where we're at, how we've messed up, God redeems sin. Like, that's what he does. So it's important that we let God be God, let him be involved, and, yeah, just being intentional. Um, marriage is a gift. It's a great thing. For those of you all that he's given that, that calling and that gift to, um, as Hannah said, just especially in that space of singleness, like, run to him and let him prepare 
because that preparation is setting the tone of how we're going into that dating relationship, how we're going to enter into marriage, how we're going to raise kids and all that sort of stuff. And so there's never a better time than today. So my prayer for you all and myself as well, that in everything that we do and every person that we encounter, we realize as a son or daughter of God, our identity and what our role in their life, no matter whether it's to be our spouse, a friend or whatever the case is, that we realize our role in their lives is to bring his love to them. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. All right, is it easy? Not always, because we lose sight of our identity. We let the world shape us with what we're thinking, what we should feel, or how to do it. But you look at a marriage and a relationship that's pursuing the Lord imperfectly, but they are pursuing him, and it is a lie to the world. And that's what we need. We need more of that. So that's my prayer, that as God continues to work in this group and in this parish and just this city and country, that he would raise up more holy men and women called to the vocation of the married life, and they would be the light to the world that we need so badly. All right, let us, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you for our time. Thank you again for your love. We ask that you would just use what was said tonight, anything that is true, that's beautiful, that is good and of you, that it may take deep root in our minds and that you may use it to convict our hearts to pursue you in a way that we never have. Lord, I pray for the protection just for chastity, for those that are struggling with addictions of pornography, that are engaged in premarital sex, that are cohabitating, that you would convict our hearts, first and foremost, that we are loved by you, and that there's nothing that we can do that will remove that love, but that you love us too much to leave us in that space, and that you are calling us to live a life of happiness and joy in something that we could not even imagine by doing it your way. Lord, I pray that you would continue to just reveal um, these vocations to the priesthood, to the religious life, and the holy marriages that would be the light of the world that we so, so desperately need. Lord, you have given us the grace in your Son. And so we ask again that you would continue to send the Spirit on this community and that you would use us in one another's lives. Lord, we entrust all these prayers to you through the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And as we pray, Hail Mary. Full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. Holy Family of Nazareth, pray for us. Of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.